Welcome to Smart Poker Study, the poker podcast for those who work to be better today than yesterday. I'm your host, Sky Matsuhashi. In last week's episode number 231, I reviewed Exploitative Play in Live Poker by Alex Fitzgerald. It's poker study time, y'all. So thank you very much for sharing the show with some of your friends. And speaking of thanks, I've got some extra big thanks to give out to Justin Robbins and Kevin Summers. They are my latest Patreon insiders. They just visited patreon.com slash smart poker study. They did it last week. They chose their level of support with the different rewards attached. And now they're on this poker train that we're all riding together. Thank you very much, Justin and Kevin. You demen. You demen. Thank you very much, guys. I do appreciate it. So if you want to support just like Justin and Kevin, just visit the website, select your level of support. And then once you do, you get access to the current month's reward and the archive of patron-only content. So once again, go to patreon.com slash smartpokerstudy. Alrighty, let's get to Poker's 1% by Ed Miller. Now, I don't think he used the term GTO in the book, which GTO stands for Game Theory Optimal. Uh, It's a way to think about poker and, and the way you play and approach your studies to the game and everything. But that's what this book is definitely about. It's all about using a Game Theory Optimal approach to the frequencies of your bets and your calls and your raises and all that stuff. So as listeners of the podcast, I know that you know that I really don't talk about GTO hardly at all. I'm more on the side of uh, exploitative play. So I'm not going to bury the lead, and I'm going to tell you right now that I do not recommend this book to most of my, my audience. But I think we can learn some good stuff from any poker book, even if we disagree with parts or even majorities of the book. So I'm still going to give you the book review, and I'm going to tell you some things that I liked and that I didn't like from the book. And I will give you three action steps that I took away from the book, along with the strategies behind each of those action steps. So please visit the show notes page for everything I discussed today, along with screenshots and links at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod232. No more dilly-dally. Let's get to it. Gambate! I wrote a song about it, like the kid here go. I played it down, that is it down. All right, so Poker's 1% was written back in 2014, and I think that's a little bit before GTO really took off and it grabbed the poker world by the brain. Uh, So in the introduction to the book, he makes a promise that he's going to show you how to do this work that he speaks about, and I'm happy to report that he does. So if the ideas that I mention here sound good to you, he totally tells you how to practice them on the felt and off the felt, especially in the final chapter or one of the final chapters. He gives an eight step process for doing the frequency work that he discusses. So that's pretty good if, you know, if you want to step into action, just like most of you do, I guess. Right. Uh, This book. He mentions at the outset that this is a game, that poker is a game of frequencies. He says, get your frequencies close to right, and you can play 48 tables like a robot and print money. And he also gives, in the very beginning, a key idea is that you want to find situations where your opponent will fold too frequently and then bet. Now, most players fold too frequently on the turn and the river. This is a logical spot to attack them. So he tells you in the book that we need to learn to identify these spots and how to attack them properly. Along with this, uh, with the whole frequency idea and attacking your opponents, he gives some basic uh, or two basic rules that hold true in most situations. Rule number one is if your opponent bets or raises, you should usually call. Rule two, if you bet one street and your opponent calls, you should usually bet again on the next street. In the book, he says that usually is roughly 70% of the time. And if somebody bets into you, he says that you should call or raise, but altogether, that continuation frequency is 70%. Now, if that sounds like a lot to you, then you and I, we're on the same wavelength here. As soon as I read that, it felt so wrong. Now, for me, if something feels wrong, if my gut is screaming at me that it's wrong, I have to trust it, right? I'd like to think that over my time poker study and poker playing that I've developed some good numerical intuition. Uh, 
After last week's episode, Chris Baltzer, one of my listeners, sent this email to me uh, when I said I was going to cover Poker's 1%, right? Here's what he said in the email. I heard you are working on reviewing Poker's 1% for next week. I just completed an 11-part series on Red Chip Poker by James Sweeney, covering it in detail. Another video released after the series is titled Questioning Poker's 1%. In the video, Doug Hull, who worked extensively with Ed Miller on the book, he talks about how when Poker's 1% came out, modern solvers were not readily available, and therefore, the theories laid out in the book couldn't be thoroughly analyzed. He goes on to run several scenarios which were laid out in the book that are not the most profitable. I'm sure you're familiar with the 70% model that the book outlines. But according to the solver, this number was off by 20 to 40% in many scenarios. Now, thank you very much uh, again, Chris, for sending me that email. And that is super interesting. Like, like I said, my gut was screaming at me, 70%? How do I call 70% of the time? So I haven't seen the videos myself, but I imagine that Chris, he's correctly relaying this information to me. So I'm not going to strive for a 70% continuance like Ed Miller discusses in the book. And I don't think any of you should. I mean, maybe there, not maybe, there are probably times when you should continue 70%, but not as a blanket statement 70% of the time. One of the things I really liked about the book, he uses what he calls a frequency pyramid. Now, this is a great visualization tool for player frequencies, and you can see a picture of it in the show notes. Now, the pyramids, they have four tiers to them, with a wide pre-flop base, which represents the hands that you play pre-flop. The other tiers, um, you know, second one up is flop, uh, third one up is turn, and the top tier is river. And the wider they are, the more hands continue on that street from the prior street. Now, I really like the frequency pyramids that he builds. He gives you a lot of examples for people that have too much junk in the trunk. Basically, they're playing too much stuff pre-flop to people that are betting too much on the turn to people that are folding way too often on the flop. He has all these different uh, frequency pyramids, right? The idea is that you don't want to have any pyramids with jagged edges. They should be smooth sides the whole way. If your frequency pyramid has smooth sides, then that means that you are not betting or calling too frequently or not frequently enough on a given street. So as you know, you can probably imagine if you're doing something too often, that's where opponents can attack you. He gives the idea of drawing frequency pyramids for your tough opponents. If you just can't figure out how to crack this opponent, how to exploit them, draw their frequencies. You know, take a look at their HUD stats um, or their stats within your database. Look at the different percentages that they're calling street by street or betting street by street or raising or whatever and draw these frequency pyramids. And I'll give you a study with purpose task related to this in a little bit. Now, something else he mentions, he says, if your frequencies are close to correct, then when your opponents play with incorrect frequencies, they will effectively beat themselves against your proper actions. And that he says also that once you understand this and implement it, you can just play your hand and ignore what your opponent may have. It's a set it and forget it kind of strategy. Now I've got to say, I do not like this idea at all. Telling you that you can play great poker without thinking and without hand reading and without understanding your opponent's range and what kind of player they are, that's just telling you like there's a magic pill that will buff up your muscles and reduce any excess fat without any work from you. And we all know magic pills like this, they're just a bunch of bullcrap, right? In this same chapter, he thinks that the HUD is overrated. And I take a completely opposite stance. Using a HUD lets you see where your opponent's frequencies are incorrect, and it allows you to take advantage of that. You can draw your opponent's pyramid so much easier with a HUD and a database of hands to draw from. And one of the things that he talks about, um, one of the reasons he gives to follow frequencies is that he makes it sound like within the text that it's our job to make it so our opponent's bluffs are not automatically profitable. And I have to disagree with that as well. I think it's our job to make the most positive EV decision at any one time. I do not think it's positive EV to prevent a player from making easy and successful bluffs. And here's an interesting thing. One of the chapters talks about good events, bad events, and non-events. Non-events are things like, you know, the turn card comes and it doesn't affect anything. It's a completely random deuce of spades on a three clubs board. That kind of thing, right? It shouldn't change anything. You should probably still have the same strategies on that non-event card. But he does say that bad events allow you to not follow the frequencies. 
So this tells me that there are so many what ifs and buts to the whole frequency based 70% strategy thing that I really don't know how useful that is. If, if there's bad events and good events, these good events say I should bet more now, bad events say I should, I should bet less. Well, how do you set it and forget it frequencies? You can't, you've gotta be taking into account all these other things as well, right? So ultimately, here's my recommendation. I do not recommend this book to most of my audience unless you're playing at the highest stakes imaginable and all of your opponents are trying to go for GTO theories. You should learn it as well in order to combat them. But you probably have to um, supplement this book uh, with like what Chris Baltzer said, they took a lot of modern solvers to the ideas in this book and you have to do the same to figure out what is actually going to work or not, right? But I recommend for anybody playing at the mid stakes, uh, I'm sorry, not mid stakes, micro stakes and low stakes, really don't bother with this book at all. Now, some of those strategies he recommends are good, like exploiting your opponent's misuse of frequencies. Of course, that's good, right? If somebody's betting way too often on one street, yeah, you should continue more often than against somebody who bets way less frequently there, right? Alrighty, I would like to give you my favorite quote from this book. Here it is. You train your brain in practice, and then in the heat of the moment, it gives you instant feedback. The more you train, the more sharply accurate the message from your brain. And I have to agree with this quote 100% of the time. I've told you before on the podcast that the most beneficial thing I ever did was my 66 days of hand reading, where I just went through an entire hand uh, bit by bit with Flopzilla, assigned a range preflop, narrowed the ranges through the streets. I think doing that 66 days in a row, it totally gave me really good in intuition for my opponent's ranges and the types of hands that they're making their different plays with. So totally, I recommend if you want to work on your frequencies like Ed Miller says, or your hand reading or understanding bet sizing, whatever it is, spend plenty of time off the felt figuring that stuff out. So when you're in that same situation later on, on the felt, you're able to access it and your intuition will help guide you to the right decision. In one week from today, Tuesday, April 30th at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, I'm going to hold my next live webinar called the Smart HUD Webinar. That's right. I'm going to teach you how to get the most from the best Poker Tracker 4 HUD available. I'll discuss all six parts of the HUD in detail, and I will cover the six custom pop-ups as well. And I'll give you plenty of stats to look for and ways to exploit those various stat percentages. Now, to watch this webinar, all you have to do is purchase the Smart HUD for Poker Tracker 4 by going to smartpokerstudy.com slash smarthud. You can use offer code POD10 for 10% off. And the Smart HUD was newly updated by myself just uh, just yesterday on April 22nd. And I've made it more user-friendly and aesthetically pleasing. Now, for some of you, you've already purchased the Smart HUD and you're thinking to yourself, oh, I gotta buy it again, what the heck? No, you do not have to buy it again. If you've purchased it, there's an email in your inbox right now inviting you to watch the webinar for free with a special link. So once again, please visit smartpokerstudy.com slash smarthud to purchase the HUD and get access to the webinar. Use offer code POD10 for 10% off. And along with the live webinar, your purchase will give you four additional training videos designed to help you effectively use the HUD. So I hope to see you at the webinar on April 30th at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Once again, smartpokerstudy.com slash smarthud. All right, and a few quick shout outs today. Frederick Hammer purchased the Poker Tracker for uh, the best software available. He purchased it through my affiliate link. Thank you very much, Frederick. Uh, he went to smartpokerstudy.com slash poker tracker four. And for doing that, I sent him my Smart HUD in thanks. So thanks, Frederick. And speaking of the Smart HUD, John Sanford just purchased it as well. So of course, he's going to get the webinar for free. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate it. Everybody, once again, go to smartpokerstudy.com slash smart hud to make your purchase and a couple other things nile purchased how to study poker volume one and volume two pdf copies through my special gum road sales page he didn't go to amazon he got pdfs instead so that he can read them on his cell phone or on his computer and there's links in the show notes page for that and Torsten Rowan purchased the Effective HUD Use Webinar. This was last month's March 2019's webinar. And um, 
really the, the smart HUD webinar that's about to come out discusses specifically the smart HUD and the stats and the placement of all the stats there. But the effective HUD use webinar teaches you, if you're kind of unfamiliar with HUDs, how to get more out of your HUD, how to learn the placement of the stats, and how to start using it effectively to exploit your opponents. So thank you very much, Torsten. Alrighty, back to class, poker people. So I want to give you my three favorite strategies uh, and action steps right here. So the first one is a study with purpose action step. It's called, what's your plan with that hand? Now, th that's a question that Ed Miller asked within the book, and it spurred me to create this first task. Here it is. In your next study session, filter in your database for hands that you limped with. Review each of these hands and ask yourself the question, what's my plan with that hand? Try to answer it as logically as you can. If you don't have a good answer for it, maybe something like, mm, I don't know, I just want to get lucky on the flop, then that's probably a hand you should strike from your preflop v-pipping range. In the study session following this one, filter in your database for hands where you call the preflop raise. Ask yourself that same question, and if you can't answer it logically, consider striking that hand as well from your preflop v-pipping range. Finally, in your third study session, filter for open raising hands. Ask and answer that same question, what's my plan with that hand? If no good answer comes, maybe you should not have opened with it. All right, so I really like this study with purpose because you've got to realize why you are playing certain hands. The more frivolous or hopeful your reason is, the less reason to play the hand. And if you're entering because of the hand's value, or the opponents are easy to exploit, or everyone is folding to your steal, that's great. You have some logical reasons right there. But if you're entering just to strike it big with a flush, a straight, or a set, then you likely should not be playing the hand. All right, here's the second study with purpose. Draw your tough opponent's calling frequency pyramid and their betting frequency pyramid. So sometimes pictures can tell people more than numbers or words can tell you. So I like this pyramid drawing exercise to help you understand where your opponent's frequencies are messed up, which of course should help you exploit them better. So here's the task. You know many loose aggressive and tight aggressive players that give you a hard time at the tables. Think about their style of play if you are a live player and try to draw their frequency pyramids for both betting and calling. And if you're an online player, pull up their stats in your database and utilize those to draw their pyramids. Where do they have obvious frequency issues? How can you exploit them? Draw the pyramid in your poker journal and list out your exploits so you can use it the next time you play a session with this player. Alrighty, and the third task is a play with purpose related to the one that I just gave you. And it's called Exploit Your Opponent's Frequency Issues. Here it is. The next time you face one of the opponents you drew pyramids for, look for every opportunity to exploit their frequency issues. You should have written down at least two different things that you can do against them. Now pay attention to the action, and if you enter a pot with them, look at your list of exploits and figure out which ones you could potentially use right now. Also, try to put yourself into situations where you can use the exploits that you came up with. Tag and review each hand where you try to exploit your opponent's frequencies. Challenge! Here's my challenge to you for this episode. Choose one of the three action steps I gave you today and take action with it. If none of them really sound all that good to you, great! Step into action with your own action step. Whatever you're currently reading or studying or listen to, create your own action step from it and get to it, either on the felt or off the felt. Now it's your turn to pull the trigger and do something positive for your poker game. You better wake up. The world you live in is just a sugar-coated topping. There is another world beneath it. The real world. And if you want to survive it, you better learn to pull the trigger. This episode is not complete until you head to the show notes page at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod232. Go there for screenshots and links to everything I discussed today and to find ways to support the podcast and keep me keeping on.
Well, thank you so much for listening today. And of course, thank you very much, even though I didn't recommend it, to Ed Miller for writing Poker's 1%. He's also written other books like The Course and Playing the Player that I thoroughly enjoyed. I do recommend those ones for you. If you enjoyed this episode, please tell a friend or leave a glowing five-star review on your favorite podcatching app. And don't forget to buy the Smart Hut so that you can get the webinar, the one-hour webinar on how to use it effectively. Just go to smartpokerstudy.com slash smarthud. All righty, poker people. In the next poker book-related episode number 233, I'm going to review Poker Satellite Strategy by Dara O'Kearney and Barry Carter. I've heard good things about it, and with the WSOP coming up, this might be a helpful read for those of you heading to Vegas. Word of mouth is the best advertising, so thank you very much for sharing the show with other poker people. Your sharing and caring is what helps us grow. Until next time, study smart, play much, and make your next session the best one yet.